Well, thank you for this introduction. Uh, I think at this time most of us could use a drink, and we're talking about water. So I will try to be concise and not elaborate too much about my PhD topic, which I will defend next month. Um, the reason that I did this research was because we were looking at the removal of arsenic with subsurface iron removal. But in the course of the research, we found out that a lot of work is considered uh, the iron. So today I'll give a presentation just about the iron. And tomorrow, one of our students, David, will give a presentation about arsenic as well. Uh, first, a brief introduction to this technology. Uh, subsurface iron removal has been there for a long time. I think the first full-scale plant was built somewhere in Scandinavia. And in the beginning of the 1900s, uh, there were two patents in Germany showing that it's a really old idea using uh, oxic water in an anoxic aquifer to remove the iron in situ, so in the subsurface, without any treatment afterwards. Um, as I said, we are looking at this technology to mitigate arsenic problems, and we're focusing on Bangladesh. We did a field study there the past years. I will not be going into that, but the reason was... Uh, to look at the decentralized use, so to see if we could use subsurface technology at a hand pump level. This also explains this drawing, which you could also look at from a larger scale, but this is a small scale setting. So normally water is abstracted from the surface, subsurface containing iron and arsenic. Uh, the idea is that once every few weeks, Water is introduced into the subsurface, which contains oxygen. It could be aerated groundwater, or for example, in the Netherlands, we just use drinking water. This water uh, oxidizes the surface around the tube well. Uh, so it doesn't oxidize the water, but it oxidizes the iron on the soil. This oxidation process results in a zone around the tube well, which contains oxidized iron. So when you start abstraction, the groundwater will pass your oxidized surface and iron 2 will be absorbed to the iron 3 on the surface. And arsenic, which is also absorbed to iron oxides, will be removed as well. So in the course of time, uh, iron oxides will grow on your soil grains around your tube well. Well, if we look at the graphs, um, maybe it's, it's difficult to grasp straight away, but this is really useful to look at the injection front and the iron front. So I'll first, for, first go to the A1, the one on top. On the vertical axis is the concentration, and the horizontal axis is the distance from the well. So left is the well, and all the way to the right is the distance from the well. And when you're injecting your water, oxygen will be consumed. So your injection water travels into the ground, but your oxygen front will lag behind because oxygen is consumed. And the same will happen, happen if you abstract, which is the bottom graph, when you abstract the groundwater, your iron too will be delayed because it's absorbed in your ground. So it's a matter of oxidation during injection and absorption during abstraction. Well, subsurface iron removal in the Netherlands has been operated for several decades now, uh, both in the west and the east. Uh, in the west location, so location 11, 12, and 13, those are from Oasa Drinking Water Company, and they use it for uh, nitrification in their biofilters, so they don't use it for iron removal. But in the east, they do use it, and uh, we also found out that a lot of farmers use it for irrigation water, which is illegal, because you're not allowed to introduce anything into the aquifer without uh, permission, but still they use it a lot and, uh, uh, to remove the iron. One of the benefits of this technology is that it gets better over time. So most filters clog, need backwashing, but this uh, technology improves after every injection abstraction cycle. While well, this graph illustrates the uh, iron concentrations on the vertical axis, and the V divided by VI is the volume you can abstract with low iron divided by the volume you put in. So it's an efficiency ratio. You could also see it as time. So with time, you pump up uh, water containing iron. And in cycle one, so that's the first injection abstraction cycle, you get iron breakthrough pretty fast. But then after several cycles, it gets better and better and better. 
Um, from the location in the Netherlands, we saw that, uh, of course, pH is really important. At a low pH, this will not, be, this will not succeed. At a higher pH, uh, it, it can succeed. And uh, we also saw when you introduce higher oxygen concentrations in your water, so instead of using saturated oxygen concentrations but at more elevated concentrations, for example, by injecting it with pure oxygen, you get even better efficiencies. So these efficiencies go up to 25 which means that if you, if you inject 1,000 cubic meters, you can abstract 15,000 cubic meters without iron. This plant operates iron, I think, below 0.02 milligrams per liter. Uh, what we also saw is that not just iron is being removed, but the uh, cycle that we see for iron, so low uh, when there's just been injected, going up when you start abstraction, we saw the same trend for arsenic and for phosphate. So that made us think, made us also work for arsenic removal. But the first question I always got at the beginning of my PhD, what happens in the ground? Is it sustainable? Doesn't it clog the aquifer or the well? And uh, is it something that you can use for a long period of time? And uh, in the Netherlands, since it's been operated for a long time, at many locations they know it works, but there's been only very lim limited research on why does it work, why doesn't it clog? I mean, you can imagine uh, a sand filter with all that sludge, if that accumulates in your aquifer around your well, you have a big problem. Well, what we did to, to look at that is we uh, drilled nearby subsurface iron wells, which had been used for 12 years. So we drilled 5 meters from the well and we drilled 50 meters from the well and to see how the iron accumulated. Um, these are the results just for iron. On the left is the graph uh, for total iron. On the right is the graph for amorphous iron. And uh, what you can clearly see that at, at least one of the wells, there was a really high peak at the height of where the, the well filter was. This peak could be seen for total iron, but also for amorphous iron, which shows that uh, the iron uh, removal process is in a specific layer in this aquifer. Uh, and looking at the axis, you can also see that the percentage of amorphous iron is pretty small compared to the amount of total iron, which indicates that the iron accumulates as a crystalline form, which al we also saw with uh, different uh, analytical methods. And crystalline iron is better ordered than amorphous iron and has less uh, volume than the iron sludge we see in most filters. And we also saw uh, that uh, certain other constituents uh, co-accumulated with the iron, which is kind of worrying in case of the Netherlands, because you're not allowed to, to build any constituents up around uh, your tube well, especially not in an area where you have a lot of drinking water wells. And you can also see, for example, that manganese is being removed, uh, and this technology has also been used for manganese removal in the past. Well, does it clock? I mean, the theory is there, but what is the practice? Uh, the practice is it doesn't clock. Even better, it clogs less than a normal well. These are uh, graphs from the same side where you can see uh, the drawdown on the vertical axis and then time on the horizontal axis. And uh, the top one are two normal wells, and you can see that the drawdown is increasing with time. So the, there's more resistance, and uh, they have to uh, rehabilitate the well. Uh, and then on the bottom is the subsurface iron removal well, which stays really stable. And they still clean it once in a while because the operators get worried that it, it's not getting clogged and they're supposed to clean it. Uh, but it's working much better. And one of the theories is why it's working better is that uh, uh, the clogging is reversed. So the particles that are normally gathering near the production well are pushed back into the aquifer every month because at this site they inject every month. Well, now I get to the paper, which is in the proceedings. Uh, and it's a column study, because we wanted to focus a little bit more on the, the oxidation uh, adsorption mechanism that is occurring during injection and abstraction. And in the subsurface, it's rather difficult to monitor that. So we made small column settings. Uh, and here you can see. And we used uh, just normal groundwater from the treatment plant. And uh, we dose arsenic, which is not so interesting for this presentation. Uh, and we use sediments from the different locations near the well. So we had just clean filter sand. We had sediments from within the oxidation zone, so high in iron. We had sediment a little bit on the boundary, and we had sediment uh, further away from the tube well. And we wanted to see uh, if the oxidation, uh, so the oxygen consumption during injection would be higher in the sediments, and if the iron removal would be better. 
Um, well, this is a normal uh, cycle, just to show how it works, with the uh, filter sand. On the vertical axis is the uh, concentration, and the horizontal axis are the pore volumes. And uh, the black line shows the tracer compound, and the, the red line the oxygen. And then the, uh, the gray dots show the iron uh, breakthrough. So you can see that compared to the oxygen in this certain setting, the iron is retarded. Ooh, sounds a little bit weird. It's, it's later than uh, the tracer, 42 volumes. So that is the same efficiency as I mentioned earlier, V divided by VI. So this would be extremely fantastic. But this is synthetic groundwater just with iron and pH and, and ionic strength buffer. So this is an ideal situation. Uh, and what's most important, at least for the water supply companies, is when does the iron break through? So that is, in this case, the moment of 25, which corresponds pretty well to what they see in the field. And if we go to the arsenic removal, um, here is uh, the same graph with arsenic in uh, the presence of iron and the absence of iron. And we see that iron, arsenic is delayed significantly in the presence of iron. But we also see that arsenic breakthrough happens immediately. So this is not the same as for iron, unfortunately. Now, back to the oxidation adsorption mechanism. This is the oxygen concentration during injection in the columns, and we measure, of course, after the columns. And what it shows is that the normal filter sand, which is also saturated with iron too, uh, consumes less oxygen than the, the sediment from within the oxidation zone. So this confirms what we thought, that it's an adsorptive oxidation mechanism. And now if we look at the iron removal for all those different sediments, uh, we see all the way to the left the filter sand, which is just clean silica sand. Uh, we see sediment A, which is uh, all the way to the right, which has the most iron, which is close from the well. And then B and C, who do it uh, in between those two. So this confirms that the longer the system is in use, the more efficient it, the more efficient it gets. And apart from adsorption, uh, we wanted to take a look at the other characteristics of iron oxides in the aquifer, and that is cation exchange, because cation exchange may occur if you change from one water type to the other during injection and abstraction. So we looked at the columns with injection of water instead of just oxygen water. We looked at the situation of anoxic water, but high salt water, so high sodium concentrations. And indeed, we could see that during the injection phase, there was leaching of, or desorption of iron too from the uh, sediment. And during abstraction, there was uh, a retardation again. So on the left is the injection phase, and on the right is the abstraction phase. And if we compare the sediments uh, uh, for the runs um, uh, with uh, salt, water, salt water, so with sodium, you can see that the sediment that did it the best for the iron removal also had the highest exchange capacity. So this confirms that also exchange capacity may play a role during this process. Now, that went quick, right? Um, the concluding remarks. Clogging off the well and the aquifer was not an issue in the field uh, at the subsurface iron removal site that we investigated. Um, accumulated deposits, I misspelled that, were found to be crystalline rather than amorphous, so that minimizes the amount of clogging. And I think I wanted to add that uh, the, the, the amount of area you use in the subsurface is massive compared to the dense amount of uh, area you have in your filters, uh, so that also diminishes the amount of clogging. And other constitu constituents were found to co-accumulate, and uh, the accumulated deposits enhance the iron removal process. And I just wanted to point out tomorrow's presentation by David Moot about subsurface arsenic removal in a different geochemical setting. So that's really interesting as well. And I want to acknowledge my two promoters, Professor Hans van Dijk and Professor Gary Amy, and my supervisor Jasper Verberg, and Weer uh, de Vette of Oase and Drinking Water Company. And as I said, I will defend my thesis next week. And two days ago, the book came back from the printer. So if you're interested, just pass me your business card and I will send you a book. That was it.